Go. Um, I just need to get rid of got it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> good evening, colleagues in Australia. Um, I'm speaking to you actually quite early in the morning from the UK. And I'm going to spend my 30 minutes talking a little bit about the rise and fall, and hopefully um, the second coming of economic history in Australia. And um, I, I've got a little roadmap here for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to begin with a disclaimer, um, and we can get that out of the way rather quickly. I'm not an economic historian of Australia. I um, don't actually know very much about the economic history of Australia, um, apart from uh, the work of my um, close colleague uh, here in Oxford, um, erstwhile colleague Deborah Oxley. Um, but I have worked um, for many years in economic history, and I've worked both as an economic historian in economics faculties, both in the United States and in the UK. And I've worked as an economic historian in a history faculty at the University of Oxford, for example. And I'm finally now working as an economic historian in a freestanding economic history department at the London School of Economics. So I have some experience of working as an economic historian in different institutional settings. And that turns out to be quite important in terms of the potential explanations of the decline of economic history and each of these potential explanations also has implications for how resurgence recovery might take place um, and i've sketched here four potential explanations that we're going to have a look at in in this 30 minute session um, the first i've called um, a neglected child of two distracted and increasingly disinterested parents. Um, and we'll look at that in, in more detail in a minute. And in actual fact, that's the kind of standard explanation for the decline of economic history in different times and places. So this is really the explanation that we've seen used in the UK, for example, to explain um, the retrenchment of economic history. Um, but to give this some particular Australian context, um, we, we also have explanations that suggest that economic history was crowded out um, by economics um, in an institutional and resources crunch. So that's a kind of particular Australian spin on, on, on the first explanation. And also a, a third explanation um, which um, I'm going to look at more closely, which is um, advocated by Claire Wright in her outstanding uh, new book, um, explains how freestanding departments, Australian economic history developed through freestanding departments, and that this led to isolation from other supporting disciplines, and also perhaps turn research interests um, inwardly. Um, the final kind of explanation um, is one associated with um, Andy Seltzer's recent article in the Australian Economic History Review, where he argues that Australia was very close to adopt the best practice of economic historians elsewhere, and now they're catching up, and that's a, 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 a source of um, optimism for the future. So each of these explanations then has got um, implications um, for how future resurgence might take place. And this is um, a, a figure taken from David Meredith and Deborah Oxley's um, excellent paper on um, the uh, rise and fall of Australian economic history. I can really recommend it to, to people who are interested. It's in the Rutledge Handbook of Global Economic History. And um, you can see there the very dramatic um, expansion of economic history in the um, 60s, beginning in the 60s and, and running right through um, the 80s, and then, uh, in fact, a rather precipitous decline. 
So let's have a look at then at the first kind of explanation, which is the, this argument um, that we find both in the US, the UK, in Europe as well, that um, economic historians really are the neglected child of two distracted parents. Um, economic history is, as Claire Wright argues, inherently interdisciplinary, but it's got additional complications. It straddles both the social sciences and the humanities. So it's, it's actually, um, in Oxford, it would be called interdivisional as well as interdisciplinary. It's actually involves both quantitative and qualitative evidence. And um, those, the loyalties of the parents to this child were, I think, um, strained even further by developments within both history and economics um, in the, the 70s and 80s, particularly by the 80s. Um, we can think here, of course, that history took a cultural turn and embraced postmodernism, um, whereas economics um, famously took a neoliberal turn and fixated on markets and became um, what my students call micro macro metrics. And so there was a kind of reduction in the content um, of e economics itself. And um, of course, this meant that, that economists became disinterested in anything other than capitalism. So, of course, that meant that they were disinterested in most of history and most of the world where capitalism, you know, wasn't the way in which the economy was organized. And of course, economics became theory and technique heavy. Um, most papers involved theory plus the model, sometimes hypothesis testing. Um, with econometrics um, increasingly um, common and increasingly multivariate regression analyses and even and ever more complicated um, regression techniques. So historians found economic history increasingly incomprehensible, <laughs> frequently boring, um, and um, at odds with the fashionable approaches of their discipline. And, and economists found economic history only tangentially relevant and after mastering micro macro metrics, they, students had little stomach for studying the context of, of questions or of going to archives and of um, devising their own um, empirical evidence. Um, now, the, these themes occur in pretty much all the explanations for the um, decline of, of economic history um, in, in uh, Australia. But there are, as I said at the beginning, other kinds of um, themes also um, initiated. So Meredith and Oxley, in, in their contribution to the Routledge um, handbook, um, argue, and they use a lot of quantitative historical evidence to support this, they argue that although these ideological and the theoretical trends were apparent, it was also to do with um, the institutional arrangements whereby economic history was located in faculties of economics, business, and commerce. And these were geared towards vocational training and useful qualifications. And in the tightening resources after the 1960s, Many university administrators began to protect core activities and they restructured curriculum, which margin marginalized and eventually eliminated economic history courses from many um, overall degree courses. So this is really a story of really vocational education that it, this links up with what uh, Claire Wright calls the Scottish model in Australian higher education. And, um, and you can see it if you look at um, Oxley and Meredith's um, graph here, because you, figure here, because you can, you can in fact, sorry, you can in fact compare what happens in economic history with what happens in commerce. So this is a kind of drying up of student demand directed by administrators who are protecting core courses um, within their um, rather um, vocationally orientated higher education 
Now, Claire Wright has a different take on this. You can see here, this is a picture of her forthcoming book. I think it's, it's actually um, hot from the press, this cover. And um, she uh, provides us with a rich prosopographical history. She interviews economic historians. She looks at um, materials that they have, have um, shared with her about their experiences. And she describes how the expansion of the subject in the 19th 50s coincided really with an expansion of the higher educational system. And so um, people were relaxed about the growth of courses, about hiring, um, because in fact the whole system was expanding. But in, and this meant that expansion often took place in Australia rather differently from in the UK and in the United States, because it took place through the formation of separate departments. And Claire argues that this actually had adverse feedback effects into economic history because economic historians didn't forge links. They weren't um, fertilized. Their ideas and their imagination and their techniques were not fertilized by contact with, with other disciplines. And, um, and then when there is a tightening of budgets associated with the contraction of, of in fact, the cohorts of students feeding through the system, um, their university administration really um, starts to, to, in fact, look at these departments and say, well, where's the students? You know, where's the, where's the research? And um, she sees this as really, um, together providing the, the, the decline of the subject. Very interesting book. I advise you to have a read of this. Um, and finally, I want to think about the uh, look from uh, the journal, from the Australian Economic History Review. And here you, you've got some two nice papers. There's the classic paper by Stephen Morgan and um, Shanahan, um, which looks at the supply of economic history um, in the Australian Economic History Review and um, using a lot of bibliometric data, they look at the methodological approach, the JEL classification, the country of study, um, author information, and this has been extended to 2017 um, with three additional pieces of information by Andy Seltzer in um, an, an article published um, in um, 2018. And uh, interestingly, um, Andy adds um, really whether the, um, <laughs> the additional pieces of information that are really cited, so rep this represents the direction in which economic history is, is going. Um, citation counts, the number of observations in any data set users, and whether in fact econometrics is used. And Andy uses this to argue that um, the Australian Economic History Review reflecting Australian economic historians was a late comer to the new techniques and in particular was a late comer to big data. He shows that all 13 of the papers that have more than a thousand observations were published since 2001. And, um, and that there's a lag here behind um, the big three, behind the Journal of Economic History, Explorations, and the Economic History Review. But he also shows that the Australian Economic History Review is competitive with other regional economic history journals. And a comparison here might be, for instance, with the Scandinavian Economic History Review. And he also shows, and this is um, taken from um, the Australian Economic History Review, he also shows that in fact, um, Australian economic histo historians are catching up. So regression analysis is becoming more um, common in the journal, more, more articles are using these kinds of econometric techniques and data sets are increasing in size um, and range. So several of these um, interpretations, Claire Wright's interpretation, and um, particularly Andy Seltzer's um, representing, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the late adoption, um, the emerging 
emergence of Clio in Australia, um, the increasing use of, of um, econometrics, they um, have some cautious optimism regarding the future trends. And this is backed up by um, a look at, for instance, um, new hires, um, the stabilization of numbers in economic history in Australian higher ed. Um, and I, I think that does suggest um, that there's grounds for what they all describe as cautious optimism. Um, I think that there are some other pieces of evidence that we might use to shore up this cautious optimism. Um, there is a resurgence of interest generally in areas where Australian researchers have experience and traditional interests. Um, I've listed some here, you can think of many others. Migration, interest in indigenous people, um, anthropometrics, which was you know, pioneered by um, Australian economic historian Steve Nicholas, was very important in the in, in initial um, well-known papers in anthropometrics, um, as was Deb Oxley, for example. And um, of course, interest in Southeast Asia and interest in China, um, very significant. Um, there is also more big data coming on stream in Australia. And um, Andy Seltzer shared with me communication from Hamish Maxwell Stewart about the Tasmanian longitudinal data, um, which looks absolutely fabulous, you know, and really would be fun and, 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 and very interesting to work on. Um, there's also some resurgent interest in economic history from both parent fields, and I think this might be an underlying cause for cautious optimism. So in history, we've seen the demise of postmodernism and the rise of interests in varieties of capitalism. Um, there's a, a, the new history of capitalism, although um, scholars in these areas tend to want to distance themselves from traditional economic history, um, which they see as, as, as um, going to the dark side with some of their uh, theoretical and um, empirical approaches. Um, but there's also significant interest in ecological history and in global history, both of which um, Australia is, is well positioned um, to, to contemplate. In economics, um, the financial crisis of 2008 was heralded as, you know, causing economists to turn to the past to have a look at um, financial crises in the past. Um, the, the, there was a whole lot of, of new interest in the 1930s, for example. Um, I myself don't think that particular um, resurgent interest in economic history lasted much longer you know, than, than a couple of days. Um, but there is also interest in, for instance, climate change, which might cause economists to think historically. Um, and here also interest in globalization. And uh, really a, a very important contribution was Piketty's work on inequality, which used theory, which used empirical evidence, but which was quite innocent of complicated econometrics. And so incredibly accessible and wonderfully written, by the way. So, um, you know, it reached out to a mass audience. It became a coffee table book um, and nothing like commercial success to fire up economists' interest, I think. But I want to express some caution here. Um, and this is a caution a little bit different from the cautious optimism um, of you know, um, the bibliometrician, um, Andy Seltzer, or, or you know, uh, Claire's careful prosopography. Um, I want to ask, is a more secure future obtainable only if economic history becomes a subfield of economics, adopting its methodology and focus. And freestanding departments may have restricted contact with neighboring disciplines, but absorption into economics, I think also threatens interdisciplinarity. And I'm speaking here, as I mentioned in the beginning, as somebody who has worked for many years, over 25 years in total, in economics departments.
So what is the cost of security? What does life in an economics department mean for the future of economic history? Um, will economic historians be captured as Persephone is being captured here by Hades? Will, economics, will economic historians be captured by their bigger, um, more powerful hosts? And this, I'd like to contrast this with um, the quotation that Claire finishes her book with, um, which is from Deb Oxley, where she says, I want to see economic history flourish, not narrowly as a little branch of economics, but as a big eclectic agenda. So an independent life for economic history within economics. Well, what I want to finish with is to suggest here that economics itself has moved on. And the new emphasis is not just on demonstrating associations amongst variables using econometrics, but as Andy Seltzer himself points out in his 2018 article, as showing causal economic relationships. Causality in econ has become the, the key word in both econometrics and in economics. And causality in econometrics requires identification. So I went to a conference quite recently, and every single paper, somebody in the audience, and this was supposed to be a, a, a conference that reached out you know, to ancillary disciplines, but every single paper was greeted by people in the audience jumping up and saying, what's your identification strategy? And this rise of, of, of increased fixation on identification of, and uh, trying to grasp causality in, Context where simultaneity is important, where feedback effects are endogenous, where um, ubiquitous, you know, where, where in fact um, it's very, very difficult to establish causality, has led to the rise of experimental economics. And randomized control trials or RTCs, for instance, have come to dominate the evaluation of projects and policies in development economics. So you, to, to, to get at causality, the argument is economics must, must in fact model itself on science. We must in fact try and, and develop randomized controlled trials. And this has heralded new approaches and new techniques in economics and in economic history. And this is of course what comes about if we are included in economics faculties. So economic historians, too, have begun to focus on natural experiments with as if random assignment to treatment and control groups and to the econometrics that goes along with that, including regression discontinuity designs, um, use of instrumental variables um, to, to kind of represent as if <laughs> random assignment. So, there are some really positive implications of this uh, new interest. The first is that if the research design is sufficiently strong, really rather simple and transparent quantification can identify causation in natural experiments. And I want to just illustrate this, if I've got time here, with a historical example. Um, and this is the classic case of John Snow's demonstration that cholera was a waterborne disease. Um, some of you may know about snow on cholera, but um, what he, he did here was he pointed to um, a very significant natural experiment. And this is that water supplies um, for London were provided by and large by two very large water companies, um, Lambeth on the one hand and Southwark um, and Vauxhall on the other. And um, these households were as if randomly assigned to these water companies because the decisions about piping and so on had been taken years before. And in fact, landlords had made the decision. Individual householders often didn't even know which company they were in fact deriving their water from. However, in 1852, Lambeth moved its inlet pipe upstream, accessing water from the Thames before it had passed through London and before it received gallons of raw sewage and became horrendously contaminated. 
So Snow showed that the death rate from cholera per 10,000 cases in the epidemic of 1853-4 was 315 among households supplied by Southwark and Vauxhall and 37 among households supplied by Lambeth. The research design here is so strong and so convincing that um, you have to accept, I, I think it's, the, the assumption of random assignment is really um, very, very convincing. And that's then seen, suggests that this, the simple summary statistics were enough to demonstrate that cholera was a waterborne disease. So this is an example of a very robust, very convincing natural experiment, a historical example. So natural experiments then are the order of the day. They're the fashionable thing in economics and economic history. And the past as a source of social science natural experiments uh, then opens up. And there's an opportunity here for a genuine and important synergy. It, these natural experiments can involve social science issues, not just economics issues. And that's why I chose particularly, although it's such a beautiful example too, the John Snow and cholera, because of course this is an epidemiological um, example as well as an economic example. And the econometrics here can be simple, transparent, accessible. Uh, Snow only used here, you know, the proportions and um, difference in proportions to demonstrate the relationships. Um, furthermore, the analysis of any natural experiment has to be accompanied, indeed buttressed, by what Thad Dunning in his great book on natural experiments in social science calls causal process observations. And this involves auxiliary evidence that assignment was as if random, that a credible causal process existed, and that the mechanisms in such a process can be demonstrated in the contextual evidence. These causal process observations essentially involve knowledge of context. Painstaking legwork that economists have called shoe leather research. Shoe leather research is often qualitative and it's the terrain of economic historians. Here we are enormously comfortable. And um, what I'm suggesting here is that natural experiments with in fact their shoe leather research surroundings provide a fruitful blend of qualitative and quantitative methodologies within which economists and economic historians can partner up. So a new and fruitful partnership. Um, yes, but let's get back to the cautious part of my optimism here. Um, natural experiments are not so easy to uncover as I might have suggested. A lot of shoe leather research is needed to actually dig them up. Um, and there is a danger that the, the, um, the attractiveness of natural experiment research design might pull us away from the important research questions of our time. And this is an issue that's raised in the context of development economists, uh, economics by Angus Deaton in his really powerful, um, really powerful critique of um, the, the um, random controlled trials um, revolution in development economics. If you look at his Keynes lecture uh, in 2008, it's a really very powerful piece of, of, of writing. Um, so perhaps this new and fruitful partnership is only a part of the big eclectic agenda that Deborah Oxley argued was economic history's ideal future. And only a part two of the revitalized and genuinely interdisciplinarity that Claire Wright thinks is the best outcome for our subject. Um, I think we have to keep this big eclectic agenda and our interdisciplinarity firmly in mind if we are to resist um, becoming not merely a little branch of economics, um, but a captive 
of economics. Thank you all very much. I hope you've enjoyed the conference and I hope you've enjoyed this contribution. <laughs>